Welcome to the Asset Revolution Podcast, where each week, your hosts from Arbor Digital provide educational opportunities for financial advisors and individual investors to gain knowledge in this emerging powerhouse that is digital asset investing. The Asset Revolution Podcast is your connection to the future of digital assets and an opportunity for anyone to get off zero. Let's dive in. All right, everybody, welcome back to this edition of the Asset Revolution Podcast, where we review and bring guests on to talk about what's revolutionary and evolutionary about crypto, digital assets, Web3, and beyond. Today, I'm excited to bring to you my very special guest and my new friend, Alex Bodie. She is head of client and portfolio solutions at Runa Digital Assets, which is based in, I think, in San Diego. Correct me if I'm wrong, though there, Alex, but I'm so happy to have you on. Thank you for joining. Mark, I'm so excited to be here. Big fan of what you, you're doing at Arbor Digital and with this podcast. So really, thanks again for having me. And quick correction. Yeah, Runa is headquartered in Annapolis, Maryland, but I'm in I'm in San Diego. Um, so just a quick uh, quick point of clarification there. Perfect. I guess I just really wanted to talk about you being in San Diego and how jealous I am of, of you being in San Diego. So I'll try to leave that aside. But what we are going to talk about today, and I think we're we're going to try to make risk management fun because we've talked about risk management before on this uh, podcast, but I think you're going to bring a new flavor and it's really going to come through in a lot of the work you've done. And it's so good. And when I say that, I mean, it's so in depth and you can tell that the time, energy and effort was really thought about. It wasn't something that was just surface level and then we there was a rush to get it out. You know, this has taken years. So I'm really excited to talk about, you know, risk analysis, risk modeling, um, and the different layers you guys see and how you guys approach that. And I'll kind of chime in with some with some things there. But before we do that, I would love for you to just give a quick introduction of who you are as a human and then as a professional, as much as you'd like to share. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Maybe I'll weave in the the personal human element with the professional element. Um, yeah. So I uh, I grew up in San Diego. Um, sports were like a, a big big part of my life. I played competitive soccer growing up and um, was a center midfielder. Realized I wasn't going to to like make it uh, D one. You know, as as that center midfielder in college. So I switched over to um, to field hockey, and I was a goalie. And actually a lot of like the footwork as a goalie in field hockey, um, the work that I'd done in soccer translated really nicely to that. So mm. um, ended up going um, to Cornell in upstate New York. The weather shock was, uh, <laughs> it was mm. definitely a lot. Anything that I could buy in San Diego to prepare me for, it just didn't exist, you know, uh, to prepare me for the Ithaca winners. But yeah, played uh, field hockey at Cornell. It was an awesome experience. I actually met my wife uh, through that. She also played on the team. Um, and that. <laughs> yeah, that was, that, that was really, that was great. And then, um, I studied math originally, and then I took an accounting class and I loved it. Like, I don't think maybe you hear that very, very often, but I really enjoyed accounting. Like, I just like that you could leave a test and you knew exactly how you did everything tied out. And, um, yeah, I just, I really enjoyed it. So I ended up switching over to applied econ with accounting finance kind of focus and um, really wanted to go into accounting. The big four came on campus to recruit for internships my junior year, but that was in the middle of field hockey season. So I kind of, I just missed it. It was, it was totally my fault. And so the next wave of firms to come on was, um, you know, the banks with their sales and trading and investment banking internships. So that's what I ended up doing. I went to Barclays. It was an awesome experience as an internship, ended up going back full time and moving to New York City, which also was such an incredible experience, lived there for mm. over a decade. Um, but yeah, started my career at Bar- Barclays Prime Services, really understanding like the inner workings of hedge funds and how they operate, how they get shorts, uh, how they get borrow for shorts, how they obtain leverage, and ended up um, going to the, the buy side and working at two quantitative investment shops, first at AQR, which was a really fantastic, great group of, of people there. And learned about factor-based investing. And um, that was just a fascinating world to me. And then went to Two Sigma. Um, Two Sigma was building a product called Ben, 
which is a factor-based risk analytics platform for allocators that could analyze their portfolios and managers through like a factor-based model that was developed by Two Sigma. And it was so fun, like building out that platform and contributing to that effort uh, was great. And um, then this kind of brings me into my crypto journey. Clients of Two Sigma were asking about crypto and, and clients of then were asking about crypto. And we ended up doing some research, basically like looking at the top digital assets uh, including Bitcoin and running them through traditional risk factor models, things that included equity risk, interest rate risk, um, you know, commodity risk and credit risk. And what we found is that the majority of Bitcoin's risk and return was unexplained using those factor models historically. And so then it's like, well, what is the factor structure of digital assets? And so did a little bit of work there to, to see what that looked like and compared it to traditional asset classes. And that was in early to mid 2021. So I was a little bit late to the the crypto game, and it was all through work and through research and um, you know th that that whole effort. And I realized that I was just looking at the time series of Bitcoin and other digital assets and didn't understand like the differences between them. I was mm -hmm. looking at Bitcoin and Uniswap as if they're like the same you know same thing without understanding you know the the intricacies of the two. And so that kind of led me down what everyone calls that crypto rabbit hole to understand you know. What is Bitcoin? What are smart contracts? What are smart contract platforms, dApps, you know, NFTs, mm -hmm. you know, going along that whole spectrum. And um, my now the, the head of Runa, the firm that I work at now, she was actually also coming from the traditional finance side. She was at Western Asset, the global bond fund. She mm -hmm. was leaving there to start a digital asset investment manager called Runa. And because she was convinced that crypto and digital assets was the most important thing happening in finance. She read the Two Sigma piece uh, that I wrote, and she was like, "We, you know, would you want to come on board? I'm starting this this investment manager, and I've been with Runa now for for about a year, and um, I know this will, you know, we'll bring it into the conversation. But but risk is probably my number one thing that I'm focused on on the investment risk side of things. Um, how do we think about uh, you know a risk framework for this asset class? What can we learn from traditional finance, and what is new and needs to be modified for this 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 new asset class. Um, so that's the, the background on crypto and then just bringing it back to the human side of things mm -hmm. uh, to wrap this up. Uh, moved back to San Diego and I would say like got a got a dog during the uh, the, the pandemic, a golden retriever named Mochi who I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed with. Um, I don't play field hockey anymore. I picked up pick, pickleball, which Mark and I are gonna play next month, which I'm <laughs> excited about. Um, and I love board games. So I know, Mark, you're a video game. You love video games. I, I do love board games, specifically like engine building, resource management type games. Uh, and I love Wait. the San Diego. Oh, yeah. Hold on. Are we going to have to play some Catan as well then? I don't know. Like, anyway, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, Continue. What were you going to say? Absolutely. Let's let's play some let's play some Catan. Maybe we can exchange some wheat for ore and, you know. Yes. Love it. <laughs> start building our, our cities. Awesome. And what were you going to say? You were going to talk something about. Uh, oh, the sports. last thing was, uh, yeah, I, the San Diego just, uh, they brought on a professional women's soccer team. They're absolutely stacked. They have Alex Morgan and other national mm -hmm. team players like Taylor Korniak and Naomi Gurma. Um, and uh, yeah, so been going to their, their games and big fan of them as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for going into that very detailed personal and professional journey that you've been on both in traditional and the and the crypto world so far man i have so many things i want to ask way more on but i'm going to try to try to keep it succinct and try to only ask about a couple of things i guess the first thing that really stands out to me um, about you and especially when i think about your journey into crypto um is that a lot of times you see almost this cultural and emotional journey that people take while they're in their traditional seats or they're doing their normal day-to-days and then something clicks for them that connects with them on, on one of those two levels. And that's their initial sense that, hey, I need to pay attention to this. You know, for some, it's in, you know, financial inclusion into financial services. For some, it's a, it's a new way to, to build their own brand and wealth. Um, and for others, it's this efficiency play to where you understand what underpins the current infrastructure of something. And you see what could happen with this new technology. So then you almost make this emotional and cultural, you know, and that's what you want. You you're you're at the forefront. You're you're more of a futurist, I guess, if you could, if you could say. 
um, those people usually come in and then they do their deep dives. And then once they do that, you know, they take the red pill and they're in. Um, you actually didn't, but it wasn't like that for you. It was your analytical brain. And it was more of, hey, I just like risk. Like I'm just fascinated by the risk properties that I'm starting to see. Um, so there wasn't this cultural, emotional thing. And it wasn't until after the fact that you were kind of like, wait a second, I should probably find out what these things are. Am I capturing that right? I I just, I'm picking that up in, in your story. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of it was um, my manager at Two Sigma at the time, he was, uh, he, he still is very much involved in the space. And he was like, this is a fascinating area. And all of the, th- all the topics that you're really excited about in traditional asset classes, a lot of them don't even exist. They don't exist in digital assets, but maybe they could be applied. So really encouraging me to, to explore. And then, um, and then from there, that's exactly right. It was like, wait, hold on. What are, what are, what are these, these assets that I'm doing in the analysis on and how are they, you know, different and similar to one another? How do they interact with one another? Mm -hmm. Um, So it was through that. uh, Yeah, it was definitely through that path. Really cool. And I think the other thing I'd like to go in is something I've noticed, I've noticed in my traditional uh, career, both in in finance and throughout other business related, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities and roles is athletes make very good workers. Um, I'm curious to do you, your time, again, if you're going D1, like you're serious about it, and you've, you've spent some quality time in the sport that you're going to be you know, a player at. So I'm curious, do you take some of the process oriented things when you were an athlete to what you do today and what you've done in your career? Um, I think so. I think, um, I guess the two things that come to mind are like teamwork and then consistency. Like, uh, I guess focus for stepping back, setting a, a kind of plan of how I want to improve as a player or as a a uh, worker, you called it in the professional sense. And then what are the intermediate steps I need to, to get there? And then putting my head down and putting in that effort every day. Um, obviously you have to love what you do. You have to love the sport mm-hmm. and you have to love risk, you know, or, or <laughs> finance or whatever it is. But um, yeah, like every single day you might not want to, I guess, go to the weight room or you might not want to read that one other, you know, tab that you have open or that one other podcast that someone told you to listen to. But um, I guess putting in the time to to understand and to train, it'll eventually, you know, that consistency will hopefully get you to be a better athlete or a better worker. So I think there's that aspect on the consistency side and then the teamwork side. I, I think just just generally, like any organization where you have to work as a team to to meet some sort of goal, um, I think athletes and in, in, you know particularly like team sports, there's a lot of like camaraderie building, trusting teammates, accountability. So that side of it too. So yeah, I think they're definitely, uh, definitely parallels. Man, I love that. And uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, It's always fascinating to see you. My, my, my first life before my finance life, I guess I like to say was in uh, professional sports as well. So I'm always interested in hearing others who also had a very deep uh, connection with whatever sport they played. Um, Okay. Let's, let's move on now. Sorry. Thank you everyone for joining us on that. Um, Risk management and risk modeling. Uh, those are two things we're going to talk a lot about today. I'd love to just first start, and you mentioned some, some of the work you did about Bitcoin and that how a lot of the risk, the majority of, I think I think the stat you gave me one time was like, like 90, 91% of the yeah. risk was un, unexplainable. So take me through of when you found that out, what was the next step and what were those intermediary steps that you saw that, what was the work that needed to be done? Yep. Okay. So, um, yeah, I guess just risk in general, taking a step back in this, in, in the digital asset asset class, um, when Fidelity ended up doing this, this survey of institutional investors and they asked like, what's holding you back? What are the primary reasons that are holding you back from investing in digital assets? And the number one reason at the time, this was a year ago, so it could be outdated at this point, given the events in 2022, but it was price volatility and it's a major barrier to investment. And um, I mean, you look at what Bitcoin is the lowest risk digital asset um, outside of stable coins, one of the lowest risk, and it's still down 64% from all time highs. It's not uncommon for these assets to be down double digits in a single day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even looking at the annualized volatilities, I'm just going to pull it up so I don't misspeak, like 
Bitcoin and Ethereum have annualized 80% and about 110% volatility going back many years. You look at stock indices, they're somewhere around 15%, bond indices, 5%. So you're, you're talking about like multiples higher for digital assets. And um, I mean, the good news is that the returns have been there, right? The, the sharp ratios have been greater than one. Returns have exceeded volatility. So it's still an attractive, you know, investment opportunity from a risk reward perspective in our view. Um, but we need to understand that, that risk. And um, if you run it through those traditional risk factor models, historically, a lot of that risk is unexplained. So then where do we kind of start from there? Well, um, I think there's been a lot of work on the traditional asset side. There's, there's some great systems like Bloomberg Port and Barra and Aladdin. There's not there's there's a growing I think body of research and practitioners that are developing those platforms on the digital asset side. But I guess how we're we're kind of thinking about it are what are some of the the techniques and risk models from traditional asset classes that can be applied here? And one of the starting points that we had as kind of like a layer one pun intended for our mm -hmm. for our risk model um, is kind of borrowing from the capital asset pricing model or the cap M. Um, and for those that aren't familiar, if, if you want to explain the, the risk or return of a, of a stock, um, there are kind of three components to it. The first is the, the risk-free return that you can, that you can earn from, from treasuries, right? That's kind of like the, the hurdle rate. Then um, you have this, this driver of risk that is um, you know, kind of beta. Every single stock has exposure to just uh, shared kind of equity market risk. And it's, uh, you know, that's the return or risk that can be explained by just overall stock market movements. Um, and that risk is undiversifiable, meaning no matter how many stocks you add to your portfolio, that, that risk is not going away. You're always going to take on that equity market risk. And then finally, the third component is the idiosyncratic risk of that stock, the unique risk and return. Um, and so uh, could this type of model be applied to digital assets? Could you have Bitcoin and you have, you know, the risk-free rate? whatever that is in digital assets, some shared risk across the whole digital asset universe, and then the unique risk um, to Bitcoin, just as a starting point. Um, and so we did, did some research there. And what we found is that if you look at the top stocks, the average kind of correlation is somewhere around 30%. And 99% um, of correlation pairs were positive. And so that's like, that's the evidence, right? That, that, that these things like move together, there's positive correlations. Um, is what, what does that look like for digital assets? If you look at the top digital assets, we're moving, we're moving stable coins. And the average correlation is almost 50%. So it's even higher than it is uh, for stocks. And same thing, 99% of correlation pairs are positive. So that gave us good evidence that uh, digital assets tend to move together. There is some sort of shared risk there. Maybe this idea of crypto beta makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think our expectation is that over time, th those numbers start to go from like that 50% down to the level that you observe for stocks as the industry matures and you know becomes less driven by narratives and more by by fundamentals. That's our mm -hmm. that's our view. But for now, it's great evidence that there's you know this this crypto beta. And then we did this this other test. Um, called a principal components analysis, which is a mathematical tool to extract these shared risk components across large data sets. And the first kind of risk factor, the first principal component in our digital asset universe explained over 40% of the shared risk in that mm -hmm. universe. And so if there wasn't any sort of market risk, um, that number would be a lot lower. So that was just kind of more, more evidence for us um, and so that is like our, our starting foundational layer in our risk model um, in trying to understand like what's, you know, what's driving each of the, the assets in our portfolio. I definitely want to pause there for a little bit and linger uh, on this, you know, these different layers that you guys took to approach uh, the risk. And, and I appreciate you going into it. I think uh, we tend to agree a lot. And a lot of the work that we've done here at Arbor Digital uh, does go there's a lot of overlap between that and i think we agree and i one of our findings is i think you actually start to see and what we think it's lost a lot in the noise is well right now we get lost in everything yes all crypto assets do tend to move together we we found something very similar but now as the market matures i think one of the things that we are paying more and more attention to as it's becoming more relevant with the maturation is uh network 
correlation. So, uh, you know, Ethereum and ERC20 tokens. So how much, you know, what's, what's the beta of, is there a specific beta to just e the ERC20 or EVM ecosystem? Um, and then you can move on to other chains and see, you know, is it the same across is or the Cardano ecosystem or the Solana ecosystem? And right now it's lost in the shuffle because, you know, it's still so early and they all move so close together. But in our view, what we feel and a lot of the work that we're starting to do beyond after these initial levels is that. So I'd like to linger on kind of what you see then after you've done these new layers of work. Are you seeing any bifurcation within the digital asset markets? Where that where do you see those first places? And if if so, great, where are they? If not, then where do you see those first? Where where is it going to happen first when you when we start to see that? Because you said you mentioned that as it matures, um, it will it will happen in your view. So where does it happen first? Uh, if so, sorry, that was a long question. But no, I, I love it because there's so much. Uh, it's great to like see the validation and what Arbor Digital is doing and what we're doing and others are. Um, and so like I guess that that first that factor that I described that crypto market or crypto beta factor is just one single factor. And then you can expand it to like explain more and more risk in the asset class. And so we've, I think our high level view is that there might be four different layers and we've only done re like deep research on two of the layers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, so th this could, could change in the future, but that's our view right now. So the first layer is like this, the single factor, the crypto market, then, um, this wasn't the case historically, but like outside macro influences um, didn't didn't really influence crypto markets. That changed. That has been changing a lot more recently. Like mm -hmm. think 2022, the relationship between Bitcoin and the Nasdaq reached an all time high, and um, so I think our next the, the next layer that we've put on top of or added to that original kind of cap M like model for digital assets are looking at nine different traditional macro factors and seeing if they are relevant at all to digital assets. Digital assets being Bitcoin and ETH, the two largest, and then a market cap weighted index and an equal weighted index. And seeing what correlations have looked like, how those relationships might have changed over time, um, and how statistically significant they are in explaining Bitcoin, ETH, and, and digital asset prices. And so, yeah, what we found is that for the most part, like more recently, uh, a lot of like Bitcoin, ETH, they, they look like just another risky asset positive relationship with equities, negative relationship with the VIX, positive with commodities, negative with high yield spreads. So when spreads are widening, indicating worsening credit conditions, that's a bad uh, environment for crypto. Um, and then also negative with the US dollar, like when there's demand for this like flight to quality USD, bad environment for crypto. Um, and then we also tested inflation expectations. There's a positive relationship there, bonds, growth, and some other things. And um, where we ended up, and it's a little bit of science and art, uh, mm -hmm. is adding um, equities and inflation to that model. And I'm not talking about like CPI inflation because that's lagged and only available quarterly. We wanted something more real time that's that's daily. Um, so looking at like the market's expectations for future inflation. Um, and so we, we added those to the model as like our second layer. And then the third layer, which is kind of what you're talking about is like, um, these network, you know, these these network relationships, um, Ethereum and ERC twenty or Solana and all the tokens that are built on Solana. Um, we we first approached it, I think, from a sector perspective, um, kind of breaking up the digital asset universe into different sectors, like currencies, like where you would see like a, a Bitcoin and Bitcoin competitors, and then smart contract platforms like Ethereum, Solana, Aval Avalanche, Cosmos, etc. And then DeFi, utilities, infrastructure, gaming metaverse. And our question there was, do the do correlation structures support those, those sectors? And I think early, right now we are we are finding that they do. It's it's not like super strong. Um, and I think our expectation is it will become stronger, you know, over time when the fundamentals start to drive the market. And what I mean by that, and, and like kind of just to give more support is if you are looking at smart contract platforms, the way that you would evaluate that from a fundamental perspective, you, you can do kind of some cross-sectional co comparisons within that sector that don't necessarily apply to gaming metaverse or, or DeFi. Mm -hmm. You know, so like for smart contract platforms, you might want to be asking like, 
How many apps are being built on top of them? How many daily active addresses do they have? What are the transactions look like? What are the developers, you know, what are the fees um, that people are paying to take up block space on these smart contract platforms? So then you can start to cross-sectionally compare, like how good is Solana versus even layer twos like Arbitrum and Optimism. You can start to like make those comparisons. Whereas like within DeFi, uh, there might be, you know, you might be looking at DEXs, decentralized exchanges. And the questions you would be asking there are, what do volumes look like? How many traders are there? How many transactions per trader? You know, th things like that, that so that you can start to compare a, uni a Uniswap versus a sushi swap or something like that. So, um, yeah. And then I guess once you have those sectors, there can start to be mi some mixed relationships like Ethereum in particular as an asset has a relationship with smart contract platforms. It also has a relationship with DeFi because the DeFi ecosystem is so strong on Ethereum. And then Flow, which is another smart contract platform, has a really strong relationship with gaming metaverse because that's been that's been their focus. It's gaming metaverse apps and NFT related apps versus DeFi. So long winded answer. So those that's like the third kind of layer that that we're going to expand our risk model to. No, I love it. I think it it showcases again. We're here to showcase that there is good work being done, uh, disciplined work, consistent work. Um, but I think it, it also keep, gets me thinking about some of the struggles we've had in terms of this work that we have been doing. And that's why I kind of mentioned what I what we've done so far and kind of what we found and then hearing that. And I'd like to take it there to more of the struggles, because I think in what we're talking about, even what I said, that that's where we're starting with the work. I think when we took the sector point, so what we did is we then, we took, OK, DeFi. Great. We went across all the different ecosystems. And then we said, what are the what are the top DeFi places? You know, when Terra Luna was a thing, that was also included in this analysis, right? Um, and you have and so you have all these different base layers, and they all have their own DeFi ecosystem on within it. So I think the struggle we found when we were trying to do sector based for, as a as a starting point is we found that there actually wasn't too many uh, there wasn't meaningful relationships, and we couldn't explain because they were all acting so differently, even though they were all DeFi. And we then had to, I guess, backwards engineer it to say, okay, well, what's the difference? And we had to go back to the, that fundamental piece where, okay, it's a completely different network. And that's where, and that's where we're like, okay, I guess we, we're going to go the route then of doing network-based uh, factor analysis, especially given our, our, the investment thesis around network effects. And, you know, these are networks, you know, there's networks and then the assets, you know, they're two separate things. And then we first want to understand the relationship between the networks and the assets and how they influence each other, um, and then go into all those all these things that we're talking about. So sorry, I'm getting a little off base here, but that's the struggle we found was that we found different DeFi ecosystems were behaving differently across, and that's where then we were like, we got to figure out why are they behaving differently, and a lot of it has to do with you know these are all early stage organizations, I'll call them. Um, that are trying to bootstrap growth. And so when you have that, you have very different strategies. And especially with this new way of DAOs and organizations being attached to DAOs, and you have these groups that are funding them, then you get VC investing on top of that. And it's just, it's very hard. And so I'm just talking about some of the struggles. So I'd love to understand, did you, have you all come across any of the same or similar struggle or different struggles? I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of the struggles that you guys have run into. Yeah, um, I guess... I think this is still an area that's active research, right? Because like, um, I think there are some some recent examples, just anecdotally, that we could turn to where the the what you're just describing is exactly right. Like Solana as the base kind of layer one was really impacted by FTX, um, and so uh, and then all of the apps they could be really good apps built on top, but if you lose a lot of the interest in Solana. As, as like the base layer ecosystem, all the apps on top are going to struggle. And then kind of on the other side of things, like on the sector side, you look at like Decentraland and Sandbox, two different, you know, metaverse related, um, metaverse, decentralized metaverses. And you look at their behavior around like when Facebook changed their name to Meta. Bitcoin and ETH didn't really move, but those two took off together in tandem. Um, and same thing recently with with those that are, you know, maybe this is getting a little bit too too geeky, but um, liquid staking um, right now, the SEC just announced that or that taking action against Kraken, for the, which is a centralized exchange for their staking as a service in the U.S. So they're winding that down. 
liquid staking, decentralized liquid staking applications like a Lido, a rocket pool of fracks, those all took off together. So like there's definitely this like network relationship and then a sector relationship. So kind of figuring out th this is still definitely an active area for us. Um, and I guess other other issues that we've run into is data. Like th these are, <laughs> there is a lot of data. These networks are open and transparent. You can go on block explorers, you can get really granular level information. Um, but even like simple stuff like prices, they can vary a lot across exchanges. Um, the free data that exists on CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko is a great starting point, but there's a lot of survivorship bias there. Great mm -hmm. example is Terra. You mentioned Terra earlier, um, obviously imploded in May of 22. Um, they have a you know now like a new token, but on CoinGecko we don't see the uh, we're not we can't pull in from their API the old Terra coin, and so th that survivorship bias is going to influence any kind of results that that we're going to glean from the analysis of that like kind of token database. And then, um, yeah, I think just standardizing, standardizing data, finding out what the KPIs are for individual protocols and how to compare them is, is a challenge too. So, so those are some of the things that, that we've run into. I, I appreciate you going into some of those struggles too, because I think a lot of times we, and we, we are cute, I mean, I'm fully transparent here. Sometimes we do tend to focus on the positives and we forget, you know, it's really important to, to lean into the struggles and understand why are the struggles happening. Um, and that's going to help formulate how we continue to approach this space. Um, so I, 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 I don't want to, I guess, put any less value on kind of the work overall and not just talking about the positive work and what we found versus man, like we did so much of this and then we found nothing or we've, we still don't understand it. And, and I think it's okay. And I, I think there's this thing in the industry where like everyone wants to say, I figured it out and no one's willing to say like, we still have only figured out five to 10% of what is to be figured out. And you mentioned this space. And I think one of the biggest um, criticisms of this space, especially now, because it's something that's been touted is the transparency and the amount of data that we have access to is everyone's like, well, if you have so much data and so much transparency, how come you guys can't see this? this is supposed to be that way. And then that's that's now the elevated feedback we get. And what I've been preaching is it's one thing to have the data, but it's a totally another other thing to understand the data and then draw meaningful conclusions from the data. That's where the work is. And that's going to take time. Uh, as much as we can do so much work in a day, if I spent 24 hours, it wouldn't matter because we still just need more. We still just need more time. So um, I guess I'd love to hear your thoughts then about that, the transparency and the just amount of data we have access to. Um, whereas, yes, it's great, but now it's like, man, what do I do with this data? So talk to me a little bit how you guys approach just the data sets themselves, having as much data, learning how to discern it. Talk to me, walk me through that. Yeah, I think it, that is the fact that there is so much data and being able to understand it and derive signal from it um, and being able to understand what is driving risk versus what is predicting returns. Like those are those are different kind of different questions. Um, and so I don't know, we've, we've been relying on kind of testing out different data sources. There's a lot that's publicly available. We don't have like a huge team of data scientists. So we're like a little bit limited in that way. But um, you for and us, me both. it's like, <laughs> like one an example that that we track because we are fundamental investors at the end of the day is like is Dune Analytics. I mean, they've done a great job for some for some blockchains. They don't have all blockchain data up there, but for some blockchains, being able to kind of like understand uh, the fundamental drivers of these protocols. And I think right now it's like the question is, do fundamentals drive price? So even if we get all of this fundamental data, how impactful is it in driving price? Like that's a big question that needs a lot of kind of research and maybe market maturity um, because right now like price could take off for a certain protocol and then you actually see the fundamentals follow instead of the other way around because people mm -hmm. get so excited about what's happening then they start to actually use the the protocol so um yeah i think there's there's just like a lot of these challenges and we're so far away from understanding um you know future return prediction as well as risk explanation um and i think the fact that this industry 
is so uh, open to collaboration, like at, at its heart, right? It's like very open source. Um, so it's nice, like you would think like Arbor Digital and Runa were competitors. We're both digital asset investment managers, yet here we are talking about our research and ways that we can learn from one another. So it's one of the things that excites me the most about this, this space. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think one of the things uh, about the industry themselves is I think one of the things that the internet brought, and I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and this is going to go off the topic of risk management, uh, so I apologize to our listeners, but um, one of the things that I think about is this idea of collective intelligence. Um, I think the internet brought about being able to coalesce intelligence into communities much easier across the globe. Huge. That's such a huge thing just to bring the human race further. What I think digital assets can now also represent in this new, and again, the technology isn't new, and I want to make sure I don't forget to say that, but the way we're using it now and the way that Satoshi, you know, public, decentralized, open source, those are the new things of taking this older technology, but then applying it in new ways. And then as now there's innovation happening to this technology, but I think it's also bringing is applying this collective intelligence before you can bring everyone together, but then like you were still siloed. Uh, whether it's geographically or whether it's as an organization, you know, DAOs and, you know, collaborations like this, I think are going to exist very differently. And you're going to be able to apply the intelligence that you coalesce um, in these groups very differently. And to where it isn't going to be a zero sum game like we are used to in the traditional world. There's good, this world now makes it to where when you collaborate and you coalesce this collective intelligence and then you apply it together, it lifts everybody. And so that's something I get excited about. And so I love that you just, you brought it to my mind when you said that that's something I think with collaboration. Yeah, I like when we were preparing for this podcast and just in the name of it, right? Like asset revolution or evolution, you know, what what is so revolutionary, evolutionary about this space? And I was thinking about that question. And one of the things that came to mind is just like the way that we organize as groups toward a, a mission. And I think uh, you mentioned, DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, like there are no geographical constraints. You know, people can can work on a mission from all over the world and they're either furthering some sort of protocol or technology in the case of like ENS's DAO, or they have some sort of like shared identity that they're all working and contributing towards. And the economics of some of, you know, these DAOs or protocols, like help all of the people that are contributing to these missions um, own whatever they're they're working on um and so i think like ownership is kind of another big theme that is really unique about web3 you know ver <laughs> versus mm -hmm. you know the 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 companies uh, uh the web2 kind of companies that came before it yeah and then to tie this all back to risk and modeling uh, i think this introduces new risks to the cap the cap structure uh, and brings new risks to whether where you sit within the the capital stack right? Um, should things like this all needs to get figured out. Uh, treasuries of DAOs, right? Bring, it, all of these things bring on new risks. So while we're, and that's where I love, we got to start somewhere. And I think we are probably the best people to, to do the work first, because at least we have a starting point. We can bring in what we know and what's good about the traditional world and all the work that's been done there and bring it in here. And then as we're going through, we're going to create these new standards that are going to apply to these new organ types of organizations, these new types of way to hold treasury assets, these new networks, and these um, these new crypto assets that live on top of the networks. And then I think another risk that I see coming, and this is going to answer me my last question, is what do you see coming in terms of measuring risk and thinking about risk? What do you see as ones that you guys are thinking about that you guys haven't necessarily done deep dives into, but where you know that these are things you're going to have to potentially or at some point model out. And I think for me, one of uh, one or, or I guess I'll, I'll focus on the one place. One place we see a lot of these risks is again, the DAOs and treasuries um, and then the economic or tokenomic models that they have. So you're gonna start seeing networks instead of having one token as regulation comes. And this is where I think no one's really thinking about, well, maybe us, maybe you guys, maybe some others is, and this is it, the, um, the multi-coin or multi-token model will be something in the future because regulation will force 
these DAOs and networks to move away from, again, let's use Uniswap as an example, um, they're going to maybe move to a multi-token model as opposed to a singular token. Um, and you already see some networks doing this, but because of regulation, you're going to see new adaptations. And I think that's a risk that we're like, oh my gosh, please don't do this yet. Like, give us some time to figure this initial risk first. But what do you see and what do you at the, and the team at Runa see as like future risks that you guys are kind of starting to think about? Yeah, I think there are some risks that we're thinking about but haven't quantified. Um, so definitely regulatory risk. That's hard. That's hard for us to quantify. But I think in that sector framework, there are sectors that are of particular focus. And I think we've seen that over the past week or so we're filming this in mid, or we're recording this in mid February um, of 20 of 23 uh, smart contract risk. Um, we don't, we don't have developers on our team, but uh, for these protocols, like what are kind of the bug bounty programs they have, the auditing of smart contracts that they have, like that's a new kind of risk to this asset class. So trying to figure out how to quantify that. I think virality risk, um, you know, something like very quickly catching on. I think, especially if you're if you're going to short, which we don't do, but if you're shorting something because you think it is overvalued, I, that that's a pretty risky thing to do in this asset class because something could go viral or there's a meme or, you know, Elon Musk tweet, tweets about it. Mm -hmm. um, that could, could push the token, you know, way further. So um, that's a risk that we haven't quantified and, and really cared too much about because we're not doing, uh, we're not shorting. Um, yeah. And then I think f finally, um, this is kind of the layer four uh, of the, the risk model, which we haven't done any work on, but in traditional markets, you see these like, um, these risk premia, sometimes they're called, or style premia, where mm -hmm. you could um, explain the returns of, of stocks, for example, by looking at value factors, size factors, momentum factors. And so I think that will be an interesting area as digital assets mature. Right now, how do you define value across the entire digital asset universe? I think that's very, very hard to do, but maybe over time, especially like to, if you're talking like about a dual token model where one of the tokens is directly receiving revenue that the protocol generates, like maybe there's a, a value framework there that you could apply. Um, so I think that could give rise to, to some sort of value risk factor playing out in markets. You could see the same thing for like a small cap or a liquidity factor or a volatility factor. Momentum is, is definitely prevalent in these, <laughs> in these markets. Um, and so that's that's probably the one factor within this like layer four broad category that we spent the most time on. Man, uh, I feel like we can keep talking about this and I just want to showcase a lot of the work that y'all have done, um, but we'll put some things at the end to, to go deeper if you want to. There's a lot of great resources that Runa has, um, but I want to end this off. We got, we got a few minutes left. I want to get everyone excited about crypto, digital, web3, however you define it. And I know we, we've jammed on a few things. So I'd love for you to take one, take the next few minutes. Get me excited. I'm someone who's not excited about it. I got to get excited about it. Alex, what do you do? What do you talk about? Well, uh, I think one of the themes that we're most excited for in 2023 is, I mean, adoption is key, right? For all, for all of these, uh, you know, blockchains, if they're going to be successful, they need to see adoption. So how is that going to happen? Um, where's the next kind of blockchain user coming from? We've seen a lot of investment in 21 and 2022 from large, like non-native organizations that have been around for decades, or in some cases, even, you know, longer than that centuries. Um, and they are trying to figure out what their Web3 strategy is going to be. And they've made a lot of progress in some cases and brought non-crypto native people to this ecosystem, which is just fantastic. So to give some actual specifics and, and examples of this, um, you could look at Starbucks, Meta, Reddit, Nike, um, all of those are actually leveraging the Polygon uh, blockchain. So they have like this proof of stake sidechain to Ethereum, it's a scaling solution. And those companies have Web3 efforts utilizing Polygon. And um, just to kind of give, maybe we could talk th through Starbucks, for example, because I think it's, it's really kind of an awesome use case. They're leveraging this. Like you might ask why they're doing this. And I think one is to just improve their user experience and, and build deeper relationships with their customers. So of course, if, if you're a Starbucks user, which 
which I am, here's my uh, Starbucks yeah. cup from this morning. Um, they have Starbucks rewards, right? Which, which is their loyalty program. And they're extending that with something called Starbucks Odyssey, which um, allows you, there is in beta right now, but it allows you to go on different um, journeys. You can take quizzes about Starbucks or about coffee, or you could try maybe a new drink that Starbucks is trying to promote. And you'll earn what are called stamps. It's like a less geeky name that Starbucks has for NFTs. And those NFTs are minted and, and stored on the Polygon blockchain. Um, and those actually translate to real life experiences. Like you could take an online class with Starbucks if you have enough stamps, you know, to maybe an espresso martini class or go visit like a Starbucks roastery or a, far, a Starbucks farm, coffee farm in post, uh, Costa Rica. And I think what's so cool about this versus some other corporate initiatives is, is that it's already, it's already tied into Starbucks's existing loyalty program, their business goals, their mobile payment technologies. So I'm very, very excited to see where that goes um, in 2023. And I think if it's successful, you're going to see other brands start to enter for the same same reasons, deep, deep in that user experience and that relationship that you have with the consumer. And then on the other side, like Nike, they um, they are definitely not a newcomer to, to Web3. They bought um, a brand called Artifact, uh, I think in 2021. If you look at like Air Jordans, Converse, the Nike brands, you might see like this lightning bolt. Um, which is which is artifact it's a web3 studio brand they produce um you know digital sneakers that you can wear around in in metaverses um in other kind of digital environments and um so nike had brought out a collection with them called crypto kicks it was on ethereum and then they also announced in november of last year dot swoosh which is a web3 platform where um, you know, again, trying to deepen the relationship with consumers to co-create different digital sneakers or t-shirts um, and then sell those as, as NFTs, again, on Polygon. And um, you can, you know, wear those around in metaverses or whatever. And um, I, that, that's actually brought real, this has brought real, these efforts, real revenue to the, to the Nike brand. Um, mm -hmm. So about $186 million in revenue using Dune Analytics, a shout out to that tool that I mentioned earlier. So Kind of an orthogonal source of revenue for uh, for Nike, maybe not entirely orthogonal, but a new source of, of revenue for for Nike. Um, so yeah, I think if we're talking about adoption, it, if these companies are putting effort into having a Web three strategy, so they don't they don't miss it and they engage a new group of users who are going to be digital first, I think this is saying a lot and um, is going to to hopefully bring more adoption um, and uses to. Uh, to blockchains like Polygon. So really excited uh, about those efforts. Thank you. I, I'm excited. There you go. You did it. I'm excited. If you're not excited after hearing that, uh, I can. I know a lot of people probably have interacted with one of those two entities at one in one form or another over their lifetime uh, to where they can possibly make a connection to that. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, there are a lot of things I can go over, but I want to leave that there. You did a much better job than I probably would have ever done getting people excited. So the last thing I'd like to end with now is just some quick fire questions that I haven't prepared you for, and you have no idea what I'm about to ask. So uh, I'd like to always ask for permission first, though. Are you cool? Are you up for that? I guess so. Are you going to ask me like my Bitcoin price prediction for the, <laughs> the end of the oh, year? Oh, no, no. I, that's, like oh, my least okay. that's my least favorite question uh, to ask anybody. Um, okay. Although it is, I do use it as a discovery question just to see, just to level set where I, where someone is. But I don't need to do that with you. We're good. Uh, okay. No, okay. These, these are these are a lot lot funner if I could. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. All I'm right. For it. Let's go. Okay. Awesome. Okay. First question: What is the one thing that digital asset detractors, people who are against crypto, get right? Oh man, Mark, this is hard. Um, what do they get right? Um, I think I think the fact that a lot of these projects are going to fail. Um, I think that there is a lot of innovation happening. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot of junk out there. I forget the numbers, but tens of thousands, right, of of these digital assets. And it is definitely not our expectation that that all of those are going to survive. I think the majority of wealth creation is um, is probably going to be concentrated in a handful, just like we've seen in the stock market. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that's definitely correct. Is that there's a lot of junk out there. Love it. 
what is a learning from your childhood that you've taken into your value system and how you operate today as an adult? Oof. Um, I was, this, this has nothing to do with digital assets, uh, but I was taught by my grandparents. Um, they loved all of us unconditionally, all of, all of their grandkids and my cousins, and we've all been through some tough parts in life. Um, and so I think just like, yeah, loving people that are worth like your time that you, that you trust, uh, that are, you know, loyal to you and, uh, have your back loving them unconditionally, they're going to go through hard times and um, always, you know, being there for them uh, is, is definitely a value that I have. I love that answer. Thank you for sharing that. That's a genuine answer. Um, okay. Back to another crypto question now. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's an important digital asset or crypto resource that you think everyone needs to read or consume? Wow. Uh, that's a great, a great question. So I really, I really like um, CoinDesk's uh, podcast by NLW. Um, it's like a very quick podcast every single day, and it covers kind of like the macro on why digital assets matter. And it's quick too; it's not that long. Um, and I think uh, NLW does it does a great job. So yeah, CoinDesk podcast. Great, I would totally agree with that. And just full disclosure, um, so. Real quick, so NFW, if you ever listen to any of it, if you listen to this one, um, Simon Sinek has a love-hate relationship with Adam Grant. He was like his worthy adversary or his in, in his in his you know teachings and leadership. Um, he always says you have to have a you know uh, an adversary or an enemy or a you know someone who pushes you. Um, NLW doesn't see that me as that, but NLW is that for me. Like. I love him and hate him at the same time. Like, man, he's so good that I hate it. Um, and I'm trying to get to his level of podcasting. But uh, I love that answer because I do love his podcast. He's re it's very good. Okay, last question here. Um, what for you is the reason that you stay in digital assets? I think the fact that it is so uh, exciting and fast moving um, it's not boring at all. Like every day there's something new that's happening. Um, it's extremely technical in some ways. Um, and so I, I do like getting into those details and I'm learning so much every single day. Uh, and then I would say just one other thing is we talked about this earlier in the podcast, but the collaboration and just the spirit of people that are involved in this, uh, in this, uh, you know, ecosystem. If I have a question on Twitter and I reach out to someone, like they actually respond <laughs> mm -hmm. to me. And um, and then I think just collaborating with peers in the industry, um, anyone's willing to talk and share their ideas. Uh, so I, I love that about, uh, about crypto and digital assets. That's great. You know, like, I'm glad you have that experience. You know, I've been trying to reach out to, to Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger about crypto, <laughs> like so much in DMs and Twitter, and I just get nothing back. And I'm just like, what's up? Like, why, man, why? man I, wish, I wish they had that same spirit. But uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you, Alex, man. It has been such a joy to jam with you on this topic. Uh, I love your energy. I love the work that you and your team are doing over at Runa. Uh, shout out to them. Um, for everyone who has listened to you now and is very interested to learn more about you, about the firm, uh, where where do people go? Okay. Uh, yeah, two spots. RunaDigitalAssets.com. Um, you can subscribe. We, we put out uh, research on individual tokens all the way to just like sector and kind of macro based research. So uh, subscribe there. And then um, we post a lot on LinkedIn, not as much on Twitter, which uh, yeah, it definitely that's very trad by of us. Uh, but yeah, follow us on, on Twitter, Runa Digital Assets. We post weekly. So. Awesome. Well, again, Alex, thank you for joining me. I can't wait to have you back. Thanks so much, Mark. This was a great conversation and we'll let everyone know who wins at pickleball in Catan when we play. Uh, oh yes. Month. On, on episode two, when you come back for it, we will have the results in. Um, but until then, everyone, thank you so much for joining on this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. Please make sure to tell somebody today that you care about them, and we'll see you next time. Cheers. We appreciate you listening to this edition of the Asset Revolution podcast. 
I'm your host, Mark Nichols. Please don't forget to let us know how you like the show by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen. For more downloadable digital asset resources and educational opportunities, please visit us at arbordigital.io. We are here to help you get off zero safely and securely. Thanks again for tuning in and be sure to tell someone you care about them. Cheers. financial advisor. Unless you're under contract with or actively speaking with Arbor Capital Management or Arbor Digital, a division of Arbor Capital Management. This podcast is just that, a podcast. It is not financial, legal, or tax advice. If you have individual questions, please reach out.